If you're in a physiology or respiratory class and you see this curve and it makes absolutely zero sense to you, you are in the right place. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here where we make difficult biology concepts simple. And today we're looking at this curve. So in this video, we're gonna get to the bottom of it. So first off, in order to understand the graph, we've gotta understand the axis, right? What's on the axis? And on the x-axis, you see that it is the partial pressure of oxygen. And any pressure is going to be, and any pressure is going to be measured in millimeters of mercury. Okay, so it's pressure. That means there's some sort of force of oxygen, a gas, pushing on something. Well, what's it pushing on? Well, it's going to be pushing on a molecule in a red blood cell called hemoglobin, and we're going to look at how much oxygen actually starts to bind to the hemoglobin itself. And we call that the percent saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. And this is sometimes coined oxyhemoglobin. So even as I'm saying that, it really doesn't make sense to me in my head. So let's actually look at a visual to see how this works. So we're going to zoom in specifically to the lungs. And so this side of the membrane is going to be the lungs, the opening of the lungs. And this is going to be basically the bloodstream where we've got a red blood cell in our hemoglobin protein. Now in the lungs, is there a lot or a little oxygen? Well, there's likely a lot of oxygen because when we breathe in, we breathe in oxygen, which is just saturated full in the air around us. And so the pressure of oxygen in the lungs is somewhere around 100 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so what does that actually look like? Well, I'm gonna draw oxygen as these pretty big circles. And as you can see, they're in very high concentration in the opening of the lungs in the alveoli. Now, since there's a lot here, where do they all wanna go? Well, in nature, things like to flow from high to low, and so there will be a very strong push of oxygen into this red blood cell. Okay, great, so we know that the pressure of oxygen is high. Well, we know that the goal at the lungs is to saturate oxygen onto our red blood cells, and you can see more about blood here. But how do we actually grab that oxygen on a red blood cell? That's where hemoglobin comes in. This hemoglobin protein right here, as you can see, has a lot of different sites four per molecule, where oxygen can directly bind to. So thinking about it, if we have a lot of push of oxygen onto the hemoglobin, do you think all the sites will become filled? Absolutely. Virtually all of these sites will become filled. So if all of the sites are quite literally saturated with oxygen, we call this somewhere around 100% saturation. Now, in reality, it's something like 98 or 99%, but I'm just going to round up to 100. Well, where do we see that on our graph? Well, we see at the partial pressure of oxygen being 100, what's the percent saturation of hemoglobin? Also near 100, so our point is right here. This is showing what's happening at that point in the graph. Okay, so we're good there, but now let's take a different point in the graph. We'll take it right about here, where we're looking at the partial pressure of oxygen being 25, and we're looking at the saturation of hemoglobin. This is actually going to occur at the tissues of your body. So now we're at the tissues, and if you've learned about anatomy and physiology, you know that the tissues are constantly, constantly using up oxygen, right, so that they can make ATP. So we call these cells respiring cells which basically means that they're using that oxygen, right, to make ATP, the energy currency for your cells. So thinking about it, what do you think the partial pressure of oxygen is in the tissue cell now pushing on that hemoglobin? What do you think that would be? Well, as I mentioned, it's around 25 millimeters of mercury. So that is significantly lower. So we probably only have a few oxygen molecules in the tissue cells, and it's a very weak push into the bloodstream. So knowing that, how much of the hemoglobin do you think will be saturated with that oxygen? Well, it's going to be less because there's less force of the oxygen pushing on it. We're only going to fill a couple of these spots. So since only two of those oxygen binding sites are saturated with the oxygen, we consider that 50% saturation. And lo and behold, look at our graph, right? At the 25 partial pressure of oxygen, we are at 50% hemoglobin saturation with oxygen, being the two of the four sites. So that's explaining a couple different points in the graph. But what's the goal of this whole process, right? Well, you know that at the lungs, the goal is to saturate our hemoglobin full of oxygen as fast as possible. Whereas at the tissue, what's the goal? Well, at the tissues, the goal is actually to take the oxygen from hemoglobin and give it to the cells, right? Because the cells need it to make ATP. So there's two questions here. Number one, how do we get hemoglobin to let go of that oxygen to give it to the tissues? And then number two, what would that look like on the graph, okay? So let's get into that next. Before we go on, if this has been helpful for you at all, please like the video and subscribe to the channel where I'm dedicated to making difficult things in biology and anatomy easier for you. So now here's the same drawing of the red blood cell and the partial pressure of oxygen that I drew here. 
The partial pressure is still 25. We've still got that 50% saturation, but remember the goal at the tissue cells is to get as much oxygen off the hemoglobin as possible at the same partial pressure. Okay, we basically want to unload as much oxygen as we can because these cells need it to make that ATP. So how do we do that? Well, there's four different ways we're going to amplify this effect. So let's get into that now. But first, we have to look at the tissue cell's CO2 amount. You see, when the cells are making those ATP, they produce CO2 as a byproduct, and they actually make it in excess. So when it's accumulating in the tissue cell, that gas of CO2, which I'm representing by this line here, is actually going to leave the tissue cell and get into the plasma of the bloodstream. Now, some of the CO2 will actually combine with a very common molecule of water, within the red blood cell and outside and produce a very weak acid called carbonic acid. And we know from videos like this that acids like to dissolve hydrogen ions into solution. So we'll see this carbonic acid dissociating the hydrogen ions here, which I'm going to designate as a triangle. And they're also going to produce a conjugate base called bicarbonate, but we're not gonna worry about bicarbonate in this video. So key in on that hydrogen ion here. Whenever we produce hydrogen ions in solution, it actually lowers our blood pH. And lo and behold, there's also some sites where we can actually bind hydrogen ions onto the hemoglobin molecule itself. So I'm gonna do that. And if you know your biochemistry, anytime something new binds to a molecule, that molecule changes its shape. And when the hydrogen ions attach to hemoglobin, hemoglobin likes to start letting go of oxygen from itself. So the oxygen is going to want to start leaving, thus achieving our goal, right? So that's one of the first factors to help us achieve that goal is a lower pH. And fun fact, this whole process is called the Bohr effect. And if you want to learn more about that, I recommend you watch this video next. But just the pH itself is not enough to force a ton of oxygen off. In fact, we need a couple other helps to get to this goal. So the second thing that we're going to talk about is actually something called 2,3-DPG. And this is a big fancy molecule word I'm not even going to attempt to try to describe, but the key here is that it is produced in excess when cells are going through a process called glycolysis. And if you know anything about glycolysis, we know that it is when these cells are going anaerobic. And if you know what anaerobic means, it means the cells have low oxygen. And that's a problem, right? Because if they have low oxygen, they can't make ATP as efficiently, and they may begin to die. So one of the byproducts of this process is this molecule, 2,3-DPG. So the lower and lower the cells get with oxygen, this molecule is produced, and that can also affect this hemoglobin molecule and tell it to release even more oxygen. So combine that with the acidic nature of the region as well as this molecule, we're continuing to force more oxygen off, which is the goal, right? But wait, there's more. The third aspect is actually looking at the CO2 itself. You see, not all the CO2 goes this direction to make these components, but in fact, some of the CO2, as you can see, can bind directly to the hemoglobin itself. And as the CO2 begins to bind the hemoglobin, remember what happens when something binds it? It changes its shape, and this increase of CO2 binding to hemoglobin further kicks off the oxygen molecules from hemoglobin as well. So let me jot that down quick. So this statement right here, that the more CO2 binds hemoglobin and oxygen gets kicked off, this is called the Haldane effect. So now we've got three things that are positively influencing oxygen leaving hemoglobin, and the last thing is simply going to be an increase of temperature. Now this makes sense. So as these cells are making energy, making energy, they're actually going to ramp up heat production, increasing the temperatures at the tissues, thus further pushing oxygen off of the hemoglobin molecules. And that will free up that oxygen to go ahead and feed those tissue cells so they can continue doing aerobic with oxygen cell respiration to make ATP. Wonderful! So these four things all help kick oxygen off hemoglobin, but that was answering the first question. The second question was, what does that look like on the graph? Well, remember, the pressure of oxygen is still 25 millimeters of mercury. But what did we just do to some of the oxygen? Well, we kicked it off, right? So now, what is the percent saturation of hemoglobin? Well, we see that it is 25% saturated. And we know on the graph that's the two values, right? Pressure of oxygen and the saturation. So in this case, where would we be on the graph? Fascinatingly, we would be located right about here. And if you continue the graph with this in mind, it would look like this. So as you can see, the graph shifted right. And what influenced the graph shifting right? These four components.
So that is how the graph correlates with the actual functioning at the tissues with the hemoglobin molecule in oxygen. Well, that's how the graph shifts right, but don't you know that the graph can shift left? Well, let's see what that looks like next. Okay, so now we're at the lungs, y'all, and the goal with the lungs, remember, is to try and saturate as much of the hemoglobin as possible because it'll pick it up and then deliver it to the tissues. But here, I'm going to put the partial pressure of oxygen as relatively low, somewhere around 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so why would I do that? Well, let's say, for example, you are at altitude and the oxygen amount in the air is quite low. Well, you still need the capability to saturate your hemoglobin full of the oxygen despite the lower pressure of oxygen. So that's where I'm getting that. So as we look at the molecule, we see that about 75% of the hemoglobin is saturated, which is designated over here somewhere around this area. And I'm guesstimating, but that's about 75% saturation. I'm kind of making the line go up a little bit at about give or take 40 to 50 partial pressure of oxygen. But remember, we want to put even more oxygen on hemoglobin. So how do we do it? Well, several different ways, and you'll notice they're all reverse of this. Spoiler alert, but let's see it in action, shall we? So first off, in the lungs, there's a very low amount of CO2, and that's because there's low CO2 in the air, as we mentioned previously. So therefore, the CO2 that's packed on hemoglobin all surrounding here will actually want to begin leaving, going from high to low, as always, because things in nature flow high to low. So that CO2 is going to begin leaving the hemoglobin molecule itself. Well, that's going to increase the affinity of maybe an oxygen molecule coming on to that hemoglobin molecule, but it's not perfectly effective. So that's number one. And number two is very similar to it. Well, we remember when we had a lot of CO2, we made also a lot of hydrogen ions or acid, right? So now that we're losing the CO2, it's leaving this region, it's actually going to reverse the reaction. So it'll look like this. So now we're actually getting rid of the hydrogen ions and we're making the CO2 that's also going to continue to leave. Since we're taking the hydrogen ions off, they're also going to leave the hemoglobin molecule. So therefore, if we took out the hydrogen ions, we're going to raise the pH, thus further increasing the probability that oxygen will associate with the hemoglobin, but it's not quite there yet. The two other things you can probably predict are as follows. The first one being there's gonna be very low 2, 3 DPG. Because remember, this was produced when there was a lack of oxygen, but now we've got plenty of oxygen in this region, so therefore there's gonna be hardly any of that, further cementing that we're going to get that oxygen on hemoglobin. And finally, temperature. At the lungs, it's going to be a relatively decreased amount of temperature. And that's simply because the air is usually cooler than our bodies. And furthermore, the cells on the lining of the lungs aren't doing as much respiration as those at the tissues. So there's going to be a lot lower temperature at the lungs themselves. So that finally makes us saturate full, pretty full at least, hemoglobin with our oxygen. So now keep in mind, we kept the same partial pressure of oxygen of that 40 to 50. And we found the point right about there. But now we have near 100% saturation, right? So where would that point be? Well, you'll see that it'll actually raise to about right here. And if we fill in the graph, it'll look like this. So therefore, all of these four factors did what to the graph? It shifted it to the left. So there you have it, folks. This oxygen dissociation curve debunked, demythed, made simple. Now, I recommend you watch this video next to learn about the Bohr and the Haldane effect in more detail to understand how all this process works together.